Hello, we're in Las Vegas at the uh, 2015 Townie Meeting, 13th Annual Townie Meeting, and I thought I had to uh, interview Avi Weisfogel, because whenever your last name starts with Wise, I'm sure he was named for a very specific reason. Why did your mom and dad name you Wise? Yeah, you know, the, I think that name was kind of chosen for them on the Ellis Island part, but uh, <laughs> the Weisfogel part came from a, a mixture of two names. There's the Weisses, there's Fogels. They put my family together, and here we are. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, try to try to live up to the wise part. So you're in. Um, so so bottom line. Okay. So I'm 52. I got out of school 20 years ago, yep. and there was no word of sleep apnea. Right. You, you never heard anything about it. Yeah. So let me walk you through my journey. Um, so when I um, when s first it was snoring. Mm -hmm. And um, the ear, nose, and throats were buying these carbon dioxide lasers, and they were boring out the back of the throat. Absolutely. And every dentist had patients that did this back in the 80s. And they, um, they all said, my, 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 my litmus test is, would you do this again? And they all said no because it messed up their um, smell and taste. Right. Uh, they, they, I, I still have patients today that say that it's like eating cardboard. <laughs> Uh, from having their uva. So, so the tongue is not just taste, it's the smell, the sinuses, yeah. etc. And the, and the uh, palate, you know, it adds to part of it. Take away part of the palate, you lose part of the taste. Yeah, and, and that's a huge uh, negative with an upper denture. Yeah. I, I, I'd say more people rent and rave about how much they love their upper um, Those little implants. horseshoe dentures, yeah. Those, yeah, because those always they get, work well. Because they get the roof of their mouth back. Yep. And that, that's huge for taste. So taste is a very complex system between tongue, nose, palate, etc. So then um, sleep apnea started coming along and um, and now it's just rock star status. I mean, you can't throw a cat without finding a blog, a magazine, all over, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you know, a third of those magazines have something about sleep. Uh, really famous people are talking about it a lot. So how, how did you get into sleep apnea? And tell us your story. So I'll give you a bit of my story and I'll give you a quick background on what you're saying, which is fascinatingly amazing. I mean, we're talking sleep. You're saying you hear it everywhere. So 1992, there was a study done by a guy named Young. He studied the entire population. It was how many people are there that are undiagnosed with sleep apnea. So this is back in the 90s. You said you graduated in the 80s. I graduated in the 90s. I also had zero sleep education in dental school. And Young said 90% of the population that had sleep apnea was undiagnosed. Right? Now that all, there's all this information out there. You can't see a television show without seeing someone with a CPAP. People talk about sleep. Dentists are talking about sleep. And yet, Young repeated his study two years ago. Numbers were identical. 90% of the population still undiagnosed. And we'll talk a bit as we go further as why that is the case. But I was a senior in dental school. Um, what dental school is that? What I went to NYU. NYU. Yeah, I was a senior in dental school, and um, I have a friend who's a pulmonologist. And she said to me, you got to get involved in sleep apnea. It's going to be real big. I said, OK. I, I don't know anything about it. There's nothing about it in school. I don't have an instructor who knows anything about it. But if you think it's going to be big, I'm graduating. Maybe it'll, that'll be my niche. That'll be what I start out with that makes me a little bit different than average Joe dentist. Just happened to be that weekend, Keith Thornton, the inventor of the tap, everybody's heard of the tap, that's probably the second best-selling uh, mandibular advancement device or oral appliance next to the one from Glidewell, um, which name escapes me, um, maybe you know it, but it's the Glidewell one is big because it's easy. Gets a very easy for any dentist to do. But I took a hey, silent night, there we go. Silent I don't know where, night. I don't know where that came from. See, I was gonna guess that <laughs> Howard in the background. Detola. Yeah. But it was silent night. Okay. knows his stuff, too. We have, we've had some good conversations. But um, that weekend, Keith Thornton, the inventor of the TAP, speaking right in New Jersey. How, could, how big was that coincidence? I'm a guy who believes in all that stuff, where if things are coming together at the right time, it makes sense to do it. So I took that course and learned how to do sleep. Week one, I come out of my general practice residency, I have a sleep patient on my doorstep and figured this was going to be a breeze. I got paid 2500 bucks, had no clue what I was doing, but I repeated her sleep study six months later and her sleep apnea was gone. So I guess it, the, the science part was not that hard. The doing of the appliance, not that hard. So I figured this is going to be a great way. But as time went along, I kind of slowed down a little bit in my life, uh, the sleep part, and I really wanted to do more. Okay, I, I, I want to back you up a little bit for our viewers. Um, the, these are downloaded on iTunes on every country on earth. Tell, tell, Beautiful. talk to a dentist that's, that's sitting out there asking, 
what is sleep? I mean, what what do I care? How are they just not sleeping? All? Explain to them why this is a disease. Will do. And why this is a concern. Okay, so let's talk about what sleep apnea is. Sleep apnea is a breathing disorder. And it's not a breathing disorder that occurs while you're awake. It occurs while you're sleeping only, hence sleep apnea. So you could have a guy who stops breathing 90 times an hour while he's sleeping. He's breathing no problem when he's awake. So what happens when you stop breathing? Why is that such a big deal? And why does it even make a difference to dentists? Why are we involved in this process at all? And we'll get to that. But we're talking about talking to people, talking to patients. I love talking to patients like they know nothing. Even if they know more, than, more about sleep apnea than I did, I would talk to them in English. You know, I remember I was a dental, in dental school. We were each assigned a partner, and we're supposed to do charting for the partner, and then you sit down and explain it to the patient. And my partner says to her patient, she goes, yeah, you need an MODBL amalgam on 15. And she's looking at her like, uh, what? what? <laughs> I said, let's talk English. Let's break it down. So what happens during sleep? It's an obstruction of your breathing. What happens when your breathing gets obstructed? Think of what happens when you run straight up a hill. You're at the top of the hill, what happens? If you run straight up a hill, what are you feeling when you get up there? Weak, tired, exhausted. Tough to catch your breath, heart pumping heart real fast. Breathing. Yeah, so your body has to compensate for the fact that you've just exhausted yourself. Your heart's beating real fast to get oxygen to the rest of your body. When you have sleep apnea, Every time you stop breathing, your heart now has to make up for the fact that your body was lacking oxygen, starts beating faster. We don't want our heart beating too fast. Hence, the number one correlator with obstructive sleep apnea and any kind of mortality is cardiovascular disease. The heart starts beating real fast, it accommodates for the lack of breath, and it causes issues in the cardiovascular system. Now, if my partner Barry was here, he would talk for an hour about it, but I keep it simple and easy. Yeah, and so, so, um, how do you, for, for a dentist who's, let, let's talk to these dentists out there that have never done anything. Mm -hmm. what, 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 tell them what is possible. I mean, so you're saying that um, you would start with, um, how, would you, how would you start a sleep apnea program? In Anybody office? who wants to start sleep should take a level one course. Anyone who wants to do it. There's name, tons name, of names, them out courses, there. websites. I'm going to be partial to my guy. Barry Glassman is the man when it comes to level one in sleep. You've interviewed him before. He's speaking here. He's spoken here before. He's written articles for Dentaltown. In my opinion, he's, he's the number one guru. He is the guy to go to. He knows more about sleep than sleep doctors. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, he's amazing. And Ken Smith, who's also one of our partners, fantastic as well. John Tucker, who lectures with Shine, is fantastic. So, so how how would they find information about a uh, so let's talk Barry easy course. easiest place to go Dental Town online course. You got level one that Barry recorded a couple years ago. We got level two. He just recorded this week. Fantastic online courses to get you going. But in the end, Barry's going to tell you, until you come to one of my courses, you haven't really learned sleep. Learn it the right way, so that way when you're out there, you know how it is in almost any part of life. If you can talk about something and it flows off of you, you're the master of that thing. If you don't master your field, and you sound a little funny, patients aren't buying that you're the guy who can do this. Doctors aren't buying that you're the one they're going to refer to. You got to really know your stuff. And I must have heard Barry's level one lecture 25 times already. Fantastic each time. It's like something new each time. So really yeah, good Einstein stuff. Yeah, Einstein said if you can't explain it to a sixth grader, you don't know your subject. Yeah, exactly. So, so no, the first thing is Dennis is thinking is um, probably, um, Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna have to buy a, a five thousand dollar laser, a hundred thousand dollar three D X ray, hundred fifty thousand dollar CAD CAM? Right. But, um, what 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 does he have to buy? You got to know how to take impressions to and how to take bite registrations, and so, that's really it. So you don't. So you're saying you can do this without buying a take home sleep. You know? Buy nothing, and you can do this. And everybody should be doing this. If just us dentists, if every dentist screened their patients for sleep apnea, we could change the entire world of sleep. Now, uh, we're going to go into the difficulties that we may run into um, as we talk a little further here. But if every dentist screened their patients for sleep, we could make a dent in that 90%. And Americans see a dentist um, twice, twice for a every year. time they see a physician. Absolutely. For on average. I mean, who, you go to the physician maybe if you have uh, a cold. The last yeah. thing they're going to ask you about is sleep. Right. So, so how do you screen a, a patient for sleep apnea? So there's a couple different ways of doing it. If we're screening right out of the dental office, best way of doing it, what's called the adjusted neck circumference. 
Um, yeah, exactly. Mine, mine's off, good. Man. Mine's good. Howard may have an issue. Mine's good. Uh, but any any male size over 17 neck, any female over size 15 neck that correlates with snoring, you're probably going to end up being a candidate for a sleep test. Does it mean you're going to test positive for sure? No. But you're at least a candidate for it. And let's talk, by the way, about snoring. It's an issue. People don't want their spouses to snore, so that's an issue in well, and of what, itself. What is the correlation between sleep apnea and snoring? Because I, more Americans, in all honesty, more yeah. Americans probably um, can't stand their spouse snoring right. and worrying that they themselves have sleep apnea and aren't yeah, sleeping. Yeah, so that's probably half of my patients are sent because their spouses send them in. But for snoring. For snoring and or to check for sleep apnea. And, and what percent of loud snores probably have sleep apnea? So I, I wouldn't give you an answer on that per se, but I'll tell you 100% of sleep apneics have, a, have snoring. Every single person who has sleep apnea snores. Not every snorer has sleep apnea, but let's say anywhere between 30 to 50% of snorers, loud snorers, have sleep apnea. Now, I'll tell you what, seriously, I've done a lot of missionary dental trips, and I mean, right. sometimes you're in a room with eight dentists sleep and you're leaving some guy over there and you're just like, oh my God. Well, you ever hear those guys? Snoring and kicking and yeah. jerking. <laughs> you ever hear those guys do any of these? Yeah. You know, that's the signal to your brain. It says, hey, buddy, we're not sleeping. Get up, get up. You got to start breathing. So that's so, what so it does. Do you write something on the chart or do the hygienist ask on recall or what specifically so are you doing to screen for sleep? I'll tell you, my practice is different um, and that I'm a sleep guy. That's what I do. So what patients- What percent of your practice is sleep? 100%. And, what's and I, don't, I don't really even do any of the dentistry anymore. I have dentists who work for me up and down the state of Jersey, um, all the way from Atlantic City, all the way up to North Jersey, which is right by the George Washington Bridge. So is, Seven is dentists Governor working Chris for me. Christie your patient? I wish he was, because I could help the guy. But um, he's, he's, he's got to wear a CPAP, I assume. He's a big he's man. he's morbidly obese and just yeah. had a- um, Gastric. He did, he did. So, so, so d d just pure speculation, would a guy like that be a high candidate to have? High candidate to be a sleep apnea, apnea guy. High candidate to be a severe sleep apnea guy. So one of the things that I think keeps us valid as dentists always is knowing our limitations also, knowing what we can do and can't do. Every mild and moderate patient that comes out, what makes a patient mild, they stop breathing five times an hour. Now to count as a stoppage of breath, it's gotta be at least 10 seconds. So a little sleep 101 for you. If you stop breathing or have uh, for 10 seconds or more, that's called an apnea. If you have a disturbance of breath for 10 seconds or more, it's a hypopnea. You add up the two and you divide them by the amount of hours slept. So let's say you have 100 apneas and hypopneas and you slept for 10 hours, your apnea hypopnea index or AHI would be 10. That would put you right in the mild range. 5 to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, 30 and above is severe. As dentists, frontline treatment, keeping things real, we treat mild and moderate first with a, an oral appliance and severe first with a CPAP. My programs are really strict. Six months into it, we retest everyone. If they are not being treated successfully according to AASM guidelines, which are, they are what they are. They're not perfect, but we got to go by something. So we consider the AASM to be the standard out there. If they're not successfully treated according to the guidelines, we try something else with them. And who is that organization and what's their website URL? It's AASM.org, American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And then the dental part, American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. So, and it's .org, .org for those okay. who are looking for it. Um, and they are the go-to place for sleep. In now, the are you, are you, mostly prescribing oral retainers or do you also get into CPAP? I've, I have been involved in CPAP for the average Joe dentist. It is a huge headache. Um, it is Explain a big deal. Explain to what a CPAP is. Okay. So let's talk treatment for sleep apnea, right? That guy's not breathing. How are we going to get him to sleep? How are we going to get him to breathe while he's sleeping? Two ways. One is the CPAP. Everybody's seen a CPAP on television. It's the mask. It goes over your face forces your airway open, kind of like if somebody was giving you CPR. We're forcing the airway to stay open by blowing air in. That's what a CPAP machine is. It's yay big. They used to be, you know, like computers per se. So now you have a little machine blows air into a mask. The mask is fit over your face and it goes out at a certain pressure. The pressure is determined either through a sleep study in a sleep lab or through an automatic CPAP, which can read whether your breathing patterns while you're sleeping. 
the CPAP itself will force your airway to stay open via pressure. That's one way of doing it. The average compliancy rate in the country, our United States, 43%, meaning 43% of the patients who get CPAP wear it successfully. So there's a whole load of patients out there, probably in the millions, that were given CPAP and remain untreated to date because they were never given the option of oral appliance. Oral appliances is what we do. That's the dental part. That's the part dentists can get excited about. A, it's so rewarding to treat a patient with sleep. You're talking about a life-changing procedure. You're also talking about, in my, which is not disputed, by far the biggest profit uh, procedure there is in dentistry. So in New Jersey, the average reimbursement rate this year was around $4,900. Hard costs are about four to 500. Most of the work's done by your dental assistant. So it's a pretty neat, profitable procedure. The oral appliances- I, I would argue that the most profitable procedure though is billing insurance for procedures that weren't done. Because <laughs> there's yeah. just no time or money or anything. Yeah, seriously. That was a joke. Take it, take okay, it so and run. Tell them, tell them what CPAP stands for. It's Continuous and, positive airway pressure. And, and the oral appliance is more by keeping the jaw open and advanced. You're Advancing. just trying to open up the back. So typically the oral appliances are called MAD, M-A-D, mandibular advancement devices. Give yourself ever try to snore with your jaw out here. It's tough, right? Yeah. So the further your, further your jaw is forward, the more open your airway is. So think of the first thing you do when you get okay, someone Okay, so 100 CPR, dentists right? out there instantly just thought, what is this going to do to the TMJ? Is this, is this going to be sore in the morning? Is this Usually sore? not. Now, I can tell you back in the day when I first started doing them, I would develop, I had a handful of patients who developed TMJ issues. If patients follow instructions now, it's not a big deal. They really don't develop TMJ issues. You can develop a bite change, for sure. And sure, a bite change could then affect TMJ. But really, these are patients who were treating for a medical condition. So what's our choices here? Because I've had patients who have this exact problem. Can't wear a CPAP because they hate it. They stop breathing 50 times an hour. So only 43% comply with a CPAP. Correct. And what percent comply with a man? So 85 to 90% comply. Now, if I could cherry pick my cases, I could tell you maybe we'd have 85 to 90% success rates. But the truth of the matter is probably somewhere between 60 to 75 percent. So here's the difference between I mean, CPAP I mean, and oral 60, appliances. 65 to 70 percent. So basically, one in four just don't wear it. Not that they don't wear it; <coughs> they may not be successful. Almost everyone can wear an appliance. The compliance is not the issue. The issue is, can we treat them well? Can we get these patients to a level that's con that's considered a success? Now, I'll ask you this question: If you didn't know anything about sleep apnea and you had two choices. Choice number one, try to force them to wear a CPAP. They hate it, they're not gonna like it, they're not wearing it. Or you give them an oral appliance and there are times that they stop breathing goes from 50 times an hour to 15. Would you consider that to be a success? I would. Yeah, so that's where the standards don't always go perfect because that patient still technically has moderate sleep apnea. But we've just helped them where at least those 35 times an hour, they're doing better. And I, I don't want to talk about something that's taboo, but um, you know they say when a marriage fails, it's it's one third about sex, one third about money, one third about substance abuse. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of men and women who don't want to crawl in bed with their lover. No doubt. With a Star Wars mask on their face, I'm just like I don't want to go to bed with boots on my feet. So yeah, I hear. Yeah. So I think, by the way, you mentioned substance abuse. One of the biggest growing places that we go to for. Um, sleep apnea is pain management offices because people who are on narcotics tend to be sleep apneics. Something about the narcotics and the way you take them to, um, hinders the breathing. And so uh, because it suppresses your respiratory. Yeah. Because that, that's how you die from a narcotic overdose. It is, you correct. Suppress yeah, so pain. we're treating patients who are on pain management. The docs who get it, one of my partners is actually a pain management physician. And he is big into saying, hey, guys, if we're not treating their sleep, we're not, we're not giving them pain medication. So, so tell us more about um, um, you're, you're walking around Vegas right now. If you were walking down the strip, uh, um, give us takeaways on who do you think is sleep apnea. I mean, are they more like, like TMJ? Uh, a lot of the TMJ experts say it's 80 percent women. Mm -hmm. um, so is, is sleep apnea more women or men? Is it more older, younger? Is it more? Um, obesity, if, if you're really obese. Obesity is a given. Obesity is a obesity given. Is a and given. explain why that is. 
thick necks, narrow airways. You know, if you open someone, you know, the Malum potty classes, when you look in their mouth, if you're judging them pre-surgery and you have them open and they have a thick tongue, thick tonsils, you can't even see their uvula in the back. Those patients are likely to have obstructive breathing. So think about what happens when you're sleeping, right? You're looking up at the sky, the mouth drops. The tongue and the tissues being that they're attached to your jaw, drop back with it. Now, how big is your airway? That big? You know, you see the little tubes that go back there. They're not particularly big. The tongue and the tissue slides right over the airway. If a patient goes, ah, and you can't see back there, that's a patient with sleep apnea. Now, how crazy is it when you look back there and their tonsils and adenoids are so big and huge? Have you ever recommended a uh, sure. tonsil and adenoid removal for this? Definitely have, but not as treatment for their sleep apnea. So yeah, explain, explain that more. So let's, there's dangers in surgery. And it's why we usually will try something else first. Now, if someone's tonsils or adenoids need to come out, that's something we recommend. But we're going to recommend it usually in compliance with the CPAP. Surgical procedures done, the most popular one, you were talking about it before, is called the UPPP. You know, it's the uvula, palatal, pharyngeal, pharynx. Um, you're cutting it out. Now, all of a sudden, that patient would be a perfect candidate if you looked in surgically. But what we found is, at best, it's 50 to 60 percent um, successful. And those 40 to 50 percent that are not successful, we now can't treat them with a CPAP properly. It doesn't seem to work as well. Not sure why yet. The oral appliance certainly doesn't seem to work as well post-surgery. So we tried it, everything before our surgery just to see if those will work first. Conservative first and surgical last. Okay, what about boy, girl, young, old, ethnicities? Women, older, heavier. Yeah, so older women, you see it in for sure. You know, we do run across problems as dentists with edentulous patients. Uh, out, of, out of our lab in Allentown, we make what I think is the only appliance that's out there that goes over many implants. You know, four mini implants on the uh, upper, two on the lower, and you can make an oral appliance for a patient. So it's a great thing for a patient who hates CPAP if you're placing implants, fantastic way to use an oral appliance with it. Okay, describe to this person who's never seen one what an oral appliance would look like. Is it something on the upper, the lower? Is it connected to yes. upper and lower? Yeah, it's both. So think of what we're doing here. We're bringing the lower jaw forward. We're gonna use the maxilla, the upper jaw, as the anchor. So think of two night guards. One's going over the top, usually custom made, one going over the bottom, and they hook together. The top usually has a little connector with it that'll allow the jaw to become forward. There's a hook, typically, that's attaching the top part to the lower part, and we're gonna bring that lower jaw forward. That's the most common form of mandibular advancement device, where you use a hook to bring the lower jaw forward. There's other kinds where that can be done from the back. Those are called dorsal appliances. But. So, for, so for three-dimensional geometry, what, what is opening up the airway more? Um, opening up your mandible or moving it, the mandible forward? The vertical component can take place if we've tried to bring them as forward as we can and we can't get them done. Then we'll play, play around with vertical. Typically, it's just jaw advancement. You know, so the mandible the advancing is going to open up the back of it the is. breathing, yeah. not you, just open your mouth. You're trying to avoid obstructions, specifically upper airway obstructions. Instructions. We're trying to avoid them. You pull the tongue and the tissues away from the back of the throat, you're opening up the obstructions. So let, let's go more holistic. Um, could a person with sleep apnea um, fix themselves without a CPAP or an oral appliance if they lost weight? Um, I've read things that um, it's, it's people having three or four beers before they go to bed. Um, yep. I've read stuff. Go, go, through the, go through the unhealthy lifestyle that adds to this. By the way, this is... How a, could you reverse sleep apnea? If you want to hear a great course on this, Ken Smith gives a great course on what he calls sleep hygiene. You know, the patient's got to take a role in this process as well. Yeah, we don't want patients drinking much before bed. The best way... And why, why is that? What, 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 what's gonna, the difference between alcohol and iced tea before or water? Same difference along the lines of respiratory um, effects. You know, slowing down the breathing. So, okay. but um, typically... We are talking about um, patients who are overweight, can lose weight, and may have their apnea go away. It's happened before. It's not a definite, but if you came in and you were 5'10", 180 pound athlete who looked fantastic, and you had a sleep test, and you were positive, you're pretty much gonna have to use one of the treatments, oral appliance or CPAP. Typically, those appliances, by the way, are worn for life. Uh, this isn't mm -hmm. really a curing thing. There are a few interesting devices out there, 
which such as the DNA appliance or Perfect Start, which is a new one that comes out, which is looking to expand the palate and bring the jaws forward in a different kind of manner. Have you heard of those at all, the uh, pneumopedic devices per se? I have not. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. There's a couple of docs out there who use them exclusively. They think that they're going to treat towards a cure. They've talked about taking patients who are m really severe apneics and bringing their sleep apnea levels down to normal. Talk, talk, any other low-hanging sleep um, hygiene it's really, it's advice. about weight, it's about getting the proper amount, it's about getting the proper amount of sleep, it's about exercise, it's about everything that you think would be good in terms of living a good lifestyle is going to help your sleep process. Mm -hmm. So, is there any you know, all the, all the not fun stuff, all that stuff. Is there know. any association with GERD and sleep apnea? I mean, we, we hear in GERD that, you know, it, it takes four hours to empty the stomach, yeah. and, if, and a lot of Americans that skip breakfast eat a huge dinner that makes them sleepy and they go to bed. Does a full stomach, do you think, make you um, snore or GERD? Do you think there's any association there with There definitely is something between GERD and sleep apnea, but it's not known yet what that big something is. But if I was to go into a gastro office, 10 to 15% of the population would test positive for sleep, as opposed to 4 to 10% of the regular population. Okay, repeat that again. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the fun stuff when you yeah. think about it. And we'll talk about how we even got into this part of it, all right? I'll take you through the little steps that happened that even led me to these findings. So here I am, this guy who wants to treat sleep patients. I'm not, I got at most eight patients a month, most I ever saw, doing everything Barry Glassman told me to do. This is the king. Who knows more about sleep than Barry? He's telling me, this is what you got to do. You got to wine and dine the sleep docs. You got to go to sleep labs. You got to get your name out there. Join the hospitals. Get on the board of the sleep labs. And your relationships are going to become such that you become the guy, the guy that they go to. Now, imagine I told you this. Howard, you know what? Um, I'm a periodontist. You're a regular general dentist. I'm not, by the way. I'm giving you a little, little hypothetical. And um, we all know that I'm going to do a better job uh, on cleaning. So how about you send all your cleanings to me? What would you say? No. Yeah, take a hike, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to lose every single one of my patients on hygiene to you, where your hygienist is going to clean them as opposed to mine. A sleep doc, if they send you a patient, that patient is no longer their patient. That patient is being treated by a dentist. How many patients are you going to send to a dentist when you're losing that patient? If you have 5,000 patients and you send half of them to the dentist, you'd have 2,500 patients left. It doesn't make sense for the sleep docs, hence they're biased towards CPAP. A CPAP patient is managed by a sleep doc, an oral appliance patient is managed by a dentist. Problem, right? Why? Because we as dentists can't diagnose sleep apnea in the country. So how are we supposed to get patients? We're all relying on that sleep doc to send me patients, and he doesn't want to send them to me because he loses that patient, that's his patient. So who does he send me? You know that list of about uh, 50 horrible patients that you have in your office that you want to get rid of? Here you go. You can have all these 50. I'm going to keep the other good ones for myself. Crazy stuff out there. <coughs> but that's the typical of what goes on in this country in terms of sleep, is that the sleep doctor runs the process. We as dentists are left fighting for this tiny piece of the pie. 90% of the patients diagnosed with sleep apnea are given CPAP as first-line therapy. It means 10% of the patients are being referred for oral appliances. Every year there's more and more sleep dentists, and yet we're all fighting over this tiny little piece of the pie. I started thinking about this process because I put so much time into it, and I said, you know, if I got eight crowns a month and I had to rely on somebody else for those eight crowns, I would quit. I'd be done. I'm not doing that. There's got to be a different way for me to get patients than going through the sleep doc. So I asked my sleep doc, what do I need to do to get more patients from you? She said, you want more patients? Get me more patients. Okay, now I had a little in. My dad's a cardiologist. I said, how many are you getting from my dad? The answer was the typical, one to two per month. I said, I'm going to fix that. My dad and I started looking into sleep. I told my dad, I think that there's something going on here because my, every patient I'm seeing has cardiovascular disease. We got to look into cardiology and sleep a little bit more. My dad got so into it, he's now a cardiologist who became the first cardiologist to be board certified in sleep in the country. So 
And I saw him lecture in Vegas, what, a week ago? Yeah, a couple weeks ago. He's an amazing man. Incredible, right? Yeah, do you think you could ever get him to do a podcast with me? Or an online CE course? He definitely would. I would really love that. Yeah, he would. He would love it so, too. So, 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 what, why, what does your dad think is the connection between sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease? Put it this way: you ask him now, if you're a cardiologist and you don't treat sleep, are you treating cardiovascular disease? He'll say you're missing the boat. What came first, chicken or the egg? Cardiovascular disease or sleep? Nine times out of ten, it's the sleep disorder that caused the cardiovascular disease, and not vice versa. Amazing, amazing. stuff, no? Remember, we talked about it. That heart's beating real fast. Mm -hmm. Because of the apnea, it causes stroke. It causes cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, hypertension. You name it. Mm -hmm. So if you're a cardiologist and you are not screening for sleep, you're not treating sleep. Plain and simple. And he'll argue that till he's blue in the face. And unfortunately, docs don't get it. So when he turns blue in the face, he would be hypoxic then? Yes, he certainly would be. (laughs) Uh, but we could treat it. So, um, yeah, there's just so many um, people that I've talked to. That, that I'm talking about dentists on right. Dental Town. who are big fans of Barry um, Glassman that um, <clears throat> said that the, the one takeaway point so many dentists have said is you don't know what a good night's sleep is if you've never had one. Oh, no doubt. And there's uh, some of the biggest believers in uh, sleep medicine that I know actually are the ones that had the disease. Yep. And I mean, they just, um, they were tired their whole life. They were, they were tired for, a lot of them tell me they were tired for a decade. Absolutely. And you just, you just think, well, it's just cause you're old or, you know, it's just, that's just the way, you know, you feel when you're 40, 50, 60. So talk more about that age. Um, do, do pedo, do kids have sleep apnea? Is there? We're getting into that by the way. Now, no. the, I just mentioned that perfect start. It's the first thing that I know of that is somewhat of a treatment for PEDS and OSA. I've been in sleep for a long time now. I've opened up 27 sleep labs in the country, got them all accredited. I could not find one doc in the country who wanted to work on kids. I finally found a couple, but it really, it's just not that big out there. So it's tough to find a pediatric sleep doc. So, so what, talk more about yourself. What, what do you mean you've opened up 27 sleep labs? These are all in New Jersey? No, across the country. So I'll take it back a bit to when I said, let me get my dad into this. My dad and I opened a sleep lab. We tested his whole patient population. Now, is the sleep lab a place where a person goes and spends the night? Correct. With all the 17 different leads. I did that after I talked to Barry because I I, I listened to that. So I went and got checked out and he said, you're good. So so you you open up uh, 27 places? 27 different labs. But you opened them? I opened them, ran them. They were they were run by my company, but they were built specifically for doctors. For cardi for cardiologists at the time. Maybe there was one that wasn't a cardiologist, but of the 27, there were 26 were cardiology labs. Now, Why? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. You did yeah. one in Flagstaff, Arizona, didn't you? Flagstaff, yeah, and um, Henderson, Nevada, right here in Vegas. So uh, yeah. right here by Vegas. So it, and that Flagstaff one was an amazing operation because they, the docs were not the best business guy, so they hired a business guy, and they let him run the show. And he said, this is the protocol. The protocol is we're going to follow this, and patients are going to go in, and they're going to get tested. That's what's going to happen. When that happens, you have a fantastic result. I know if you heard, did you happen to hear the pain management doctor at my uh, course when you were out there a few weeks ago? Which one? His name is DDA Demesman. Big hulking black guy is my partner. Um, he's a pain management doctor. He's, um, he gets it. You know, we put in a system in his office, he follows it. Every doctor thinks that they may know better. If they were doing a good job screening sleep, they wouldn't necessarily need me to come in and show them what to do. So let's step back to those 27 for a sec. Remember, number one was my lab with my dad. We tested his whole patient population. This was a guy who was referring one to two patients a month. 81% of his patients tested positive. Incredible number, right? We're talking about 4,000 people. 81% 81% of his patient population tested positive for OSA, and that's when the light bulb went on. Okay, I think we just figured something else out of here because I just introduced all these patients to the world of sleep that never would have been tested before. If I can constantly do this and constantly introduce patients to the world of sleep, rather than being the guy who the sleep doctor may send that one patient to, the sleep doctors are going to be looking to me for their patients. And if they're looking to me for their patients, 
you can be pretty sure they're going to follow my rules, which are mild and moderate patients get treated with an appliance first. Now I don't have to worry about whether patients are going to a sleep doctor or not. The rules are set up. We have it set so mild and moderates come straight to the dentist. And that's something that we've set up now in over 1,600 doctor's offices in the country. Uh, and that's more along the lines of home sleep testing, which is the new rage. You know, the sleep labs were big back in 2010 and 11 when reimbursements were $4,000 a night. Now for a sleep lab study, you get maybe six, 700 bucks, which means you're making $20, $30 a study. It's just not worth it. So you think the market's moving to home sleep? I not only think it, it's, it's a fact at this point. Medicare demands first night be a home sleep test. So, okay, so um, talk specifics. My, my motto has always been uh, no dentist should have to ever practice solo again. There's uh, many types of um, units, devices. What, what do you na name brands, websites, price? Right. What, what, so what do you um, I'm partial to the Watermark device. It's uh, sleepmed.com, sleepmed. Um, their brand is, they bought the company named Watermark. The device is called the Ares. It's a great unit. Spell uh, Ares. A-R-E-S. A-R-E-S. Yeah, like the god Ares. Is in there a casino here, Ares? The Aria, close enough. Oh, that's not the same. <laughs> no, that's oh. where you were at. Our I, I was close. Too. I was close. Yeah, well, we got two letters in there. We're good. Okay. All right. And uh, and Whitey, Whitey, and what? Tell them this machine. How many electrodes? How much does it cost? What's the website? So how many electrodes? Back in the day, when you had to, when they first came out, you had to buy the units. They were about three, four grand each, and then you were paying per test. Other companies started coming out with an unlimited testing program where you would lease the machine and you get as many tests and disposables as you wanted. That's really where the marketplace is now. So start at the high end. There's a company called Itamar, which has a unit called the Watchpad. It's a fantastic unit. It goes right on your wrist and it has little finger pulse ox. Uh, I believe it's $370 a month for uh, unlimited testing, which is fantastic. The Aries, the watermark unit, is $300 a month for unlimited testing. Um, if you want to go a little cheaper, maybe it doesn't look as professional, but gives you pretty good stuff. There's a unit by the brand called ResMed, R-E-S-M-E-D. Uh, their unit's called the Apnea Link Plus, and that's about 160 bucks. Now, I, I've heard dentists tell me that uh, when they talk about different systems, a lot of them focus on um, the, um, not so much as the machine, as the software of uh, loading the test up and being able to read mm -hmm. it and all that kind of stuff. I guess uh, uh, intuitiveness of, um, of getting, you're a patient, you walk back in, you drop off this machine, how long does it take you to load it up? That stuff's computer? all great, but let's think about practicality. What's the number one thing I want? I want the patient to wear this device all night long, and I want it to be easy for them. It's why I love Watermark and why I love Watchpad. They're two really easy devices. So typically when we send a patient home with one of those, I know they're coming back the next morning with data on it. Whereas opposed to some of the other ones that are a little clunkier, maybe not look as professional looking, patient may get frustrated with it, they may bring it back and say, I couldn't sleep with this. So, so to have this watermark machine would be a $300 month lease? $300 a month. And then if a dentist, uh, so the, my doc said not there less than that, he's got a, one hygienist, he's eight people a day. Mm -hmm. um, how would you recommend um, he would be screening those eight hygienists? And, would, and theoretically, could he be sending someone home every night after hygiene? Probably not. Okay. You know, let's well, talk yeah. about the population out there. Four to ten percent of them are positive for sleep apnea. Four to ten percent. Four to ten. In a regular any store in this casino, four to ten percent. Yeah, you know, maybe if you're in McDonald's, it's higher than that. But four <laughs> to ten percent, that's the regular amount. Now we talked a little bit before when I said if you're in a gastro office, it's ten to fifteen percent of the population. Go to an internal med doc, thirty-five percent of the population has obstructive sleep apnea. Go to a pain management doc, 40% of their office has obstructive sleep apnea. Go to a cardiologist, up to 60, 70, 80% of their patients have obstructive sleep apnea. So a regular dentist doc, let's say you have 2,000 patients and you treated all of them, maybe you got 4 to 10% maybe of them had sleep apnea, and of those, maybe you could treat 40 to 50% of those. You're not talking about massive numbers. You're talking about a small piece of the pie again. But if you're just a casual observer and you want to treat patients, there's great easy ways of doing it. I wouldn't suggest paying 300 bucks a month for something you're not going to use. 
um, you could go to our website, uh, which is uh, D for dental, S for sleep, M for masters, dsmelite.com. Um, our main website, dentalsleepmasters.com, is under construction, so it's not ready yet. But if you went on there, we'd be able to hook up your patient where we sent them a device um, straight to their house and take care of the insurance and everything. It's a pretty neat process. Uh, so let's say I'm you, a your guy. your company would okay. send would send the machine to the patient's house directly to the patient's house, and then they give them a return shipping label, and then the return shipping label would have the data. Yep. Then you would download the, the data. They send back the, the machine with the data in it. We upload it to a computer. And then we have it interpreted by a board certified doc in the state. So if you're from Arizona, you need a doctor from Arizona to read your study. You know, that goes for every state in the country. And the laws are becoming stricter and stricter. So when I first started, there weren't many laws on this stuff. You know, it, it, there were laws, but not many. As home sleep testing is becoming more and more popular, they're going to make it more difficult for doctors to get reimbursed. You know, the last thing Medicare wants to do is pay claims. And what Medicare does, insurances jump on pretty soon. Right. So, so, um, so, um, so this doctor screens a patient. Again, mm -hmm. more specifics. How does a dentist? I'm I'm going to go in there Monday, and I got eight people on recall. Right. How does this doc go from never getting into this to diagnosing? Okay. So first off, let's candidate. tell them take or, the level one course. Or, or would you say this? My is this advice valid? Um, I think you're, if you're a dentist and you're making six-figure income, you deserve elite medicine. You should test yourself. A hundred percent. So I would, so I agree with you. They should log on to downtown and watch Barry Glassman. But how could that doc listen there, get a hold of you, and you send the sleep yeah. test to him or her and let her find out? Because I think the strongest believers are the ones who found out, um, I, I've had dentists tell me themselves, their spouse. Every I had dentist one tell should me, get tested. I had one dentist tell me his ADA batshit crazy teenage son yeah. uh, was, was um, it's done wonders for him. I mean. Amazing stuff. So, so, so how does this dentist, get a, you just um, send him a, a machine? You can go either go on to dsmelite.com. dsmelite.com. E yeah, or email me, dentalsleepmasters at gmail. If you send a, an email to dentalsleepmasters at gmail, we'll send you a packet back that'll tell you everything you need to do to, in order to sign up to get home studies shipped to your patients. What's really neat about the program is that we're not just shipping units to your patients. We're having your studies read by doctors who believe in oral appliances. So we're going to follow the same Avi Weissvogel guidelines, which say mild and moderate, you're going to get a chance to treat. If they're severe, we're going to put them on a CPAP and we'll hook them up with someone in your neighborhood who does what's called DME, durable medical equipment. Those are the guys who do CPAP. So, but if you send an email to dentalsleepmasters at gmail or go to dsmelite.com, we'll send you a whole packet that gives you everything you need, including the screener, which is that adjusted neck circumference. There's a little scoring table that goes with it. And it's real simple. It takes literally 30 seconds for the patient to fill it out. I think it's five questions and it's pretty predictable. So patients who test positive, we te oh, screen positive, we'll send a test to their house, have it read by a board certified sleep doc. If the patient's mild and moderate, you're gonna get a prescription for, to make an oral appliance for them. And, we're, and what labs are making these prescriptions for you? For the oral appliances? Yeah. And there's tons of them out there. You know, obviously, I'm going to I'm going to say the best one is the Glassman Lab in, in in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So Barry Glassman has a lab. Barry has a lab, and he also inspects every single one before they go out. So you're in getting Allentown? yeah, you're getting really the expert in dental sleep medicine looking at your devices before they go out to check them. Quality control can't be better. Every big lab has sleep devices now. Glidewell has them, Microdental has them, Keller has them. I mean, you name the big lab and they sell sleep appliances now. Space Maintainers is a big one. You know, any so of if it. you were a Billy Joel fan and really liked Allentown, that would be perfect. That would be perfect. But you're yeah, I don't think he shows up there much anymore, though. <laughs> he doesn't? But, uh, you know, he's looking a little hefty nowadays. He's probably got sleep apnea. Yeah, I heard he's you're having, pretty. I heard he's, uh, his fiance is pregnant. Is that right? That's correct. Well, you're from New Jersey, so is it? Uh, so are you a Springsteen fan, or what's the one? I, I may be the only like? John Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. I like Bon Jovi, and I may be the only guy in Jersey who can't stand Springsteen music. So. Really? Yeah, are you a Bon a Jovi fan. fan? I like Bon Jovi. You like Bon Jovi? My dad was actually uh, Mrs. Bon Jovi's uh, doctor. His uh, his mom. Oh, so. is that right? Yeah. 
Maybe that's a HIPAA violation. But <laughs> I, I don't think she's alive anymore. Does that count? So, so to those to those viewers out there, um, those dentists, you, you said four to ten percent of the general population. Would yeah. Be. What, what, do, what do you predict for the uh, the uh, Dental Town podcast viewers, the, the townies? I mean, you, you're at a townie convention. There's a thousand dentists here. Just walking around the town. I bet we, we go a little higher, eight to twelve percent. And why would dentists be higher than the general public? Typically, dentists, you know, our jobs are sitting down. You know, we're not we're, at, we're not necessarily that active. So we're more obese. Definitely heavier. Definitely. I don't know. What do you think? You see them out there. The, that happens to be the townie crowd's a little bit younger, so that's a good thing going in our favor. But I've seen you know some guys out there who may be a little bigger and, and may be likely to have sleep apnea. I have a friend who lost his uh, his white collar. Uh, job during the recession and everything, and he uh, was so bummed, and uh, he ended up having to uh, um, work construction in right. Phoenix. Oh my God, he went from a 220 pound fat pillar right. to now he's like a rip shredded, See that? good looking. I'm like, dude, dude, that's you're lucky. Trust that me, you're just didn't lucky. work out for him. Yeah. So, um, so I, I've, um, I'm, I've only got you for uh, 10 more minutes. Um, what uh, what low hanging fruit? Be, be, because the bottom line, th this is my belief. Yeah. M my belief is um, well, it's kind of like podcasts. Um, um, it's kind of like uh, apps on your phone. It didn't exist in 2010, and that's when it was invented. Now it's 2015. Now everybody has an app on their phone. Sure. And right now we're doing a podcast. And I swear, a year ago you couldn't find a dentist who had heard of a podcast. True. And now they're, they're exploding. So sleep medicine, it, it's new, new, new. So I'm going to guesstimate that the vast majority of people listening to this have never have they've all heard about sleep. I mean, God, I was watching something the other night where uh, um, some journalist was saying that the reason Bill Clinton um, Bill Clinton said that a lot of his worst decisions he ever made, including Monica, yeah. uh, was from exhaustion. Just you know, <laughs> bad decisions, up all night, right. irregular hours. You buy it. Uh. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it'd be like being in the White House. That must be a crazy job. Um, but um, um, so they're all hearing about it everywhere. Yep. Um, tell them more big picture from 30,000 feet. Why should they get interested in getting into sleep medicine? So there's, I mean, there's the noble there's, side. There's two reasons. Let's, let's say it's great. Everybody wants to help out their patients. We all do. It's a fantastic feeling. Let's talk practicality. A- as I said, it's really profitable. You know, some of our docs get reimbursed up to 11 grand per appliance. But that, but that's not from Delta. That's not from dental insurance. No, it's not dental insurance. This it's is all a medical, medical insurance um, process. So, so that dentist so. listening out there, he's never billed medical insurance once in his life. Exactly. Again, check out Dental Sleep Masters and. So DSM you're going to bill the medical for the doctor. We do it for them at a really, a, a really cheap price too. I think it's the cheapest price that's probably out there, about 6.99%. Um, Ken Smith also is a great company for billing, um, does a great job at it. The whole goal is once you know how to do it, it's like anything else. You know, I remember the night before I placed my uh, first implant, you know, we're allowed to curse now. I was, I was pooping in my pants the night before. I mean, I was up all night, I was so nervous. This was a guided surgery, and it was the easiest thing I had done. I said, what was I staying up all night for? Before you do anything, it's hard, it's nerve wracking, but once you do it, it's, you know. Just and like you know, a lot quick. of dentists, um, I own it to a lot of dentists that, uh, you know, they don't want to join the American Dental Association. They want to save a thousand dollars. They don't want to go to any, their state meetings or anything. And, and look at the price that, um, maybe if we were stronger in organized dentistry, um, Medicaid would reimburse for sleep medicine. I think, um, the fastest growing oral and pharyngeal, um, cancer is from human papillovirus, right. uh, for young females. And we, we're not even allowed to give an HPV vaccine. Nope. But if I go into the hospital, the nurse can. Mm -hmm. So a registered nurse can give it, but a DDS can't. And then the average American sees a dentist twice for every time they see a physician. Yet I can't give them a flu shot. But if I go into Walgreens Pharmacy, yes, a pharmacy, pharmacy tech, can. they're not even a pharmacist, can give me a flu shot. And I'm sitting there like, why can't a tech give me a flu shot and I ain't got nine years of college and I can't give one. Correct. And, and, and then when Dennis, and then, you know, when general public say, well, you're a dentist, you're not a real doctor. I always say, <laughs> well, you know, Dr. Pepper's not a real doctor, but I got to ask my colleagues, you know, this is the trade off of when you don't get involved in organized dentistry. I mean, it's real easy to sit on the sideline and bitch about everything they don't do right or whatever. Cause we all know you're perfect. You're absolutely perfect, but not the ADA. But you know, if we were stronger, 
if we were stronger, uh, we could be given flu shots. We could be um, Medicare, Medicaid, and could be getting reimbursed. And what about Delta Dental? I mean, oral cancer um, uh, is exploding in young girls, and they don't even cover an oral cancer exam. I mean, I mean, how how do you how do you deal with the dental insurance company that doesn't even reimburse you for di for a, a lethal disease of oral cancer, which kills an American every hour? Oh, by the way, this is April. This is Oral Cancer Month. Kills an American every hour and fifty thousand a year dead. And uh, and 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 we don't even stand up to a dental insurance company that doesn't even reimburse for an oral cancer exam. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. But that's. That's the business. Insurance is a business. We're the CEO of Blue Cross last year made, what, $250 million. It wasn't because he paid every claim. It was because they deny, <laughs> deny, deny. Yeah. And this is not easy, med medical billing. It takes time. It takes patience. And typically, here's a, the typical journey, right, for a doctor who goes into sleep medicine. He goes to the AASM conference, uh, the ADSM, which is coming up in Seattle, June 4th, I think, is when it is. Great conference, they learn all this brand new stuff, they're given this whole bill of goods about how amazing it is. They go home, maybe they see one or two patients, they submit it to medical, they paid their lab bill, and they get reimbursed zero, and then do nothing with it ever again. That is the typical guy. You know, every year they have about 800 people, 800 new doctor, 800 doctors at the ADSM, and I believe 90% of them are new every year, which means that people are going and they're fading out. They're not sticking around in the profession because it's not easy. You know, building this stuff up took me years to build it up. It took me years to figure out how to build this up. I can tell you that just like you're saying, hey, we as dentists got to stand up. We as dentists still can't diagnose sleep apnea. We can't diagnose it. We can give out a home sleep test, but without a doctor saying this patient needs an oral appliance, I can't do one. Same difference, right? Uh, that's it. Now, so, but you're seeing. What if a doctor sit down there and saying, dude, I, I don't want to learn how to build medical insurance? Yeah. Don't, don't do it. That's my advice. Don't bill it, but use a place that does. And, that Seven, and you could do that for them. Absolutely. Yeah, we we'll bill At them out for you. Sleep Masters. Dental Sleep Masters. Dental, spell out dental, then sleep, dental, then masters. Dental, then sleep, then masters. Yeah, with an S at the end. Masters, plural. Okay. And by, by the way, for my, my podcast, um, I love podcasts. And what I do is um, I always send the transcript to, uh, to have it transcribed. Perfect. So um, if you're driving in your car right now, you go into Dental Town after his uh, podcast is the complete transcript. And I do that because probably almost everybody that feeds back on this says the same thing. They say, you know, I live in a town of 3,000. My office is 70 miles away in a town of 12,000. So I have a 71 mile drive each way. And I love these podcasts. The they put them on Bluetooth in their car. Because you think in, a, in an hour long commute, you're saying like across LA. Yeah. But for every person driving across LA, there's 10 in rural America no doubt about driving it. across. They're just going faster, huh? Yeah, yeah, with no traffic. So, uh, so, all, so all these notes, will you also add other information? Yeah, in there's the so much still that we haven't so covered. So I can put all this stuff. Yeah, so much in there that we haven't there. covered. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give you guys the best things that you can do. Email me, Avi Weisvogel at Gmail. That's an easy one to remember. You can email Barry. DRB Glass, as in Dr. B Glass at gmail.com. We're looking to really change the way sleep is done in this country. You know, the average doc sees between two to four sleep patients a month. The highest I ever saw was 372 in one month. It's, a, it's an insanely large amount of patients. You know, over the years, you know, my company has treated over 10,000 patients um, for sleep apnea, which is just a fantastic thing. There is so much you can do to get involved in this field. I love it. One of, the, one of the coolest parts about it, let's say you don't want to do sleep only and you want to be a general dentist. You and I know 50% of the population does not have uh, dental insurance, right? Most of the patients who come to us tend to have dental insurance. So you got one out of every two people without dental insurance. What are they doing for a dentist? Some of them go, most of them don't, but they all have medical insurance. So you now have this patient who comes into your office with no dentist, no attached dentist, you can believe pretty easily the majority of those patients end up becoming my patients as a dentist as well. The last year that I did general dentistry, I only treated patients who came in via sleep. I had no hygiene anymore. 
It was just doing sleep appliances and doing dentistry off of patients who came in from sleep. I still like doing full mouth rehab cases. They were fun for me. They were challenging. Um, and did almost $3 million in dentistry that year just from patients who came in via sleep. They're all in need of, of rehabs because their teeth are broken down. They haven't seen a dentist in 10, 15 years. So it's a great way to not just build up a sleep practice. It's a great way to build up a general practice with literally no competition. And I just wanted you to close on the one thing. What percent of these uh, people with sleep apnea that got a mandibular rinse and a MAD um, had their snoring reduced? Almost everyone. You wear an oral appliance, your snoring's gone. But be, your because, apnea may Because be I gone. will have to vouch. Well, first of all, I want to vouch for you and Barry as being just great, wonderful guys. And Thank everybody you. I know loves you, and you're just uh -huh. the real deal. And our company, by the way, loves Howard and Dentaltown. You have been awesome to us since we started, so thank you. But on the street, the dentists that have got into this, they tell me the hottest thing is when all the uh, women on Facebook find out that uh, this dentist cured their husband snoring. And snoring is a far bigger issue. Um, I read a, 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 um, an article in a, um, a psychology magazine that said one of the biggest um, taboos that no one will talk about or admit is that them and their spouse sleep in separate rooms. Yep, it's a big Because if you go to work and say, oh yeah, my husband and I sleep in different rooms, they think, oh, that's weird. They're having problems, you're right? You're having marriage yeah. problems and you're not having sex and all this stuff. And that when um, you're snoring, it, it, it's a huge stressful deal in huge. the marriage. And when, when one of the spouse is snoring um, and the word gets out that you're the dentist that fixed the snoring. I mean, I just think, I just think that's, I've always said that I think um, people want their teeth clean for mental health yeah. more than oral health. Right. That people get, want whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. They don't want to be free from gingivalis. And I think more people want to stop snoring than want to um, lower the risk of sleep It's apnea. a huge deal. So, you know, there is nothing wrong with treating snoring. You know, you're saving a marriage possibly. You're helping the person for sure. Yeah, there's a, think about this, quick little one. If you stop breathing 90 times for nine seconds each time, you don't have sleep apnea. But if you stop breathing five times for 10 seconds, you do. So it's a real fine line as what defines you as sleep apnea or not. There's a whole population of snorers that when you treat them with an oral appliance, they feel better. Even if they don't have sleep apnea, you're stopping them from snoring. Everybody who wears a device, their snoring is reduced greatly first night first night well we are out of time avi darn and your parents named you right as wise uh, thank you thank and you thank howard thank you so much for Good an hour of your time uh, i really and, appreciate uh, it and, and for deliver the, your dad i want to do one with your dad i'm going to bring him in uh, he would love to do it with you and for those of you listening make sure you're at the next downy meeting this place is fantastic ah uh, thanks buddy good, you got it, good to see you buddy always